The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. IntelliFlow is on a mission to give more people access to financial advice. Their technology, IntelliFlow Office, powers and streamlines the advisory experience for over 30,000 financial advisors worldwide, making an impact at every stage of the advice process, including practice management, revenue management, cash flow modelling, client portals and more. IntelliFlow Office helps advisors manage all their client and provider data within a single integrated ecosystem that just works. Discover IntelliFlow for yourself by visiting IntelliFlow.com. Hello, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. I'm James Wrigley, and I've got the pleasure of speaking with Daniel Nell today from Tribeca. Daniel, thank you for joining me. As I said before, we pressed record. Lots of people that both I know and you know have said, oh, you've got to get down on, you've got to get down on, you've got to get down on. So uh, here we are. No pressure, but uh, but welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining me. No, thank you, James. It's a massive pleasure to be here. I don't know if 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 it's I'm that interesting, but it's surely surely fun and a and a and a massive privilege to to be speaking to you today. Yeah, I think I I think it's going to be an interesting chat. And uh, uh, you know, it, it, as you, you said before, we press record. It's it's kind of just your life, so maybe you don't think it's quite so interesting. But you but you have a what I think is anyway a really interesting past to becoming a financial advisor here in Australia, and actually yeah. started overseas. Um, and uh, I, I know very little of the story and, and on purpose because I want to hear it kind of firsthand from you and maybe ask you some questions as we get into it. So maybe let's start briefly with like, what are you doing today here in Australia? And then we'll go back to how did you actually end up here? What, what are you doing today? Great. Um, so I'm a financial advisor, um, got promoted recently, uh, work for Tribeca Financial, as you said. And yeah, I am, I'm just... Uh, seeing clients starting starting my journey as a financial advisor in Australia. So yeah, since since I say since July, been working with with and for Tribeca now a little bit more than a year and a half. Uh, before that I worked with someone we both know very well, Nathan Fradley. He uh, I started working for him in middle of twenty twenty one, all online while still in South Africa. Yeah. So what were you doing? So so were you working as a financial advisor in South Africa, like what what were you doing in South Africa before you before you yeah. joined Nathan? So I am I was working as a financial advisor in South Africa, been yeah. doing that for a little bit more than thirteen years now. Okay, um, I am still a licensed financial advisor over there as well, so licensed in both South Africa as well as Australia. Yeah, what what made you work for an Australian business? Like how how did that happen? Um, that's I think that's probably the the interesting part. I mean. Being a financial advisor over there um, for so long, I think the best way to describe it is, have you heard of uh, the concept Ikigai, the Japanese concept of Ikigai? So that's it. Okay, so that is the intersection of what you love, what you're good at, what the world needs, and what you can get paid for. So it was in, I think it was 2017, just a year after I got married, thinking, okay, what do I want to do? I'm a financial advisor. I've been living in Bloemfontein where I was kind of lived my whole life. I was like, I want to do something more. I want to kind of be more. And I was thinking, well, I love financial planning. It's awesome. And I was thinking, well, what can I do that's hard? Looking at the current you know, economic climate in South Africa, people immigrating to Australia, where I can kind of hone my craft as a financial planner somewhere else. Australia was kind of a, a, a easier fit than most other countries. English, it's not my first language, but at least I can kind of get by on English as a second language. And uh, I kind of just started looking into it. So, okay, what do I need to do to become a financial planner in, in Australia? I was a CFP back there. Still, I'm a CFP back in South Africa, post-grad, everything else done over there. And, and I kind of reached out to a few universities over here online, Got in touch with 
unbelievably helpful dean at uh, Queensland uh, University, um, Central Queensland University. She she helped me out immensely, Julie, um, Dr. Julie Knitz, and she kind of put me on a journey where I was able to understand better what I needed to do to become a financial advisor. That was at, at that stage, I think, I don't know if it's just before that or after that, at some stage during that whole period of mine in 2018, 2019, it moved to having Australian financial planners needing to have a full qualification to be a financial planner. So she said that I would need to do at least a postgraduate, which I got four subjects off as recognition of prior learning. That's basically the investment stuff, which is pretty much international, but I needed to do four full you know, postgrad sub- subjects in Oz. I did that during 2019. Online, hard, I won't lie. That's hard, superannuation. The first time I opened the book and I saw superannuation, I was like, what is superannuation? <laughs> <laughs> so that was a bit of a, bit of a mission getting that's, that done. That's strange in that, you know, you've been like, obviously, you know, different countries are different regulations and so yes. forth. But, you know, you're, you're 13 years into a career as a financial advisor and then almost starting as if you're a an eighteen yeah. year old finishing high school, going what what the hell is this thing? Exactly, <laughs> it cuts you down because what happens is you. I mean, you would know if you've been doing something for so long, you kind of get this. I I think I know what I'm doing. Yeah, and and but that's what I was looking for. I wanted to challenge myself, and when I started, you know, with this journey and I started studying and and finding and learning more about how Australian financial planning worked. I was like, okay, this is going to be hard. This is not going to be easy. But it's what I signed up for. So I did the four subjects in 2019, got the qualification, great stuff. Now now I'm going to become a financial planner in Australia. Would have gone to Queensland in, in 2020, March, did the biometrics. Because you have to get a visa, Queensland State, got a Queensland State sponsorship. Remember with the, the state said, okay, they'll sponsor my visa or our visa to go and work in the Gold Coast. And at that stage, it was the weekend before COVID. And the Sunday, did the biometrics, last step that's needed to kind of, you know, get your visa approved, everything else. And uh, our borders shut down in yeah. 2020. So, you know, that's at that stage, kind of as a financial planner in South Africa, we kind of, I kind of moved away from from business back home because what happened is, we had a kind of a, a biggish financial planning firm with my dad. I worked with him. As he retired, I said, "No, don't worry about it. You you do your you do your thing. You know, I'm going to go to Australia with my wife then, and and we'll we'll kind of I'm not going to go into the you know into the, the family kind of side of business. Yeah. And um, there I was, 2020. Not a lot of clients on the book because you know I just kind of kept kind of kept the 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 family, the people that you close friends because I knew that I won't have the capacity necessarily once I move over to Australia to act to to um, efficiently service my clients back home, the full book that I had. Anyways, so what happened is COVID started, obviously, you know, one week to slow the spread, just kind of kept going. And it was it was a a funny thing. At one stage in 2020, uh, one of the providers in South Africa, they kind of they they had a a online tutorial thing, kind of for the financial advisors, um, where a guy spoke there and he said, "What you need to do as a financial planner, you need to see yourself as a brand, as someone that is marked, someone that you kind of have an online footprint for. That you that you that when people search for your name, James Wrigley, they can see who you are, they can understand what you're about, and that's kind of how you you." You set yourself up as a financial planner and, and the online world. That got me thinking that if I'm stuck in South Africa, not knowing when the border is going to open up, I need to put myself out there. Um, and I started just on LinkedIn. I wasn't really on LinkedIn before then. Didn't see any need on it, you know, need for it. I started just connecting with people, just reaching out, reaching out, reaching out, all the while waiting for the borders to open up. Got to, got to. Um, a site or a network I've never heard of, XY Advisors. It's like, okay, interesting concept. Join, <laughs> join, join them. And this obviously now, this kind of went over to 2021 while I'm trying to kind of build a network and people that I can kind of just learn from in, in Australia because I was, got worried that I got my qualification, 
in the end of 2019. This is now 20, end of 2020, starting 2021. Who's going to employ this South African guy with no Australian financial planning experience once the, the borders open up? Um, and I'll, I'll never forget this because I, I was I posted on, on XY's The Wrong Wall. Emily sent me a message afterwards. It's like, thank you for joining XY. Great to have you here, but you know, we really don't post any you know, things like this on the main wall. But but what I asked for and what I said on that on that post of mine was, this is who I am. I'm in South Africa. I'm qualified um, to provide financial advice, but I don't have any experience. I'm willing to work for free. I just want to get some experience. And Nathan Fradley sent me a message back. And as Nathan is, the first thing he said, number one, don't work for free. <laughs> <laughs> and is number two, I might need someone. Let's chat. So we 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 kind of started talking, and I think I, I probably can't overstate the immense help he's been along the way to get to Melbourne, where I am now. Obviously, not in 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 the Gold Coast where I would have gone. But what happened is that we're we're ensemble now on X Y V kind of put me in touch with Nathan. Nathan said, okay, well, I'll give this South African a shot. I started working for him on a contract basis, just doing admin work, you can say, basically. Um, you know, the first day, well, I should I should probably say, he said to me, well, you don't really have to work Australian hours because it's nine hour time difference. It's going to be hard. And I said to him, thank you, appreciate it. But I think for me to get most value out of your knowledge, I'm going to have to work your hours. So kind of that means getting up at quarter past 12 at night, started working at 1 a.m. And well, the thing is, no, no, I, I wouldn't say that. I, I kept thinking that it's okay. In a couple of weeks, the border will open up. Just a few more weeks, a few more months, it's going to open up you know, soon. Um, but that was that was the commitment, and I think that kind of ties back to what I said about you know the ikigai. What was my purpose? Because I kind of decided way back when when I started this whole journey in 2018 was that this is what I wanted to do. I want to do something hard and see what I can be if I really give it a go. So getting up at quarter past twelve, you know, started working at one wasn't really that hard. It was hard because I kind of have to had to figure out a way to be functional. It's just because your brain it's it's it, it, it does things to your brain, <laughs> which is weird, you know. Um, and and at first morning when I when I got there, Nate, it's like, okay, please call Netwealth, and, I, and it's like, who's Netwealth? You know, it's like, all right, I had to Google Netwealth. That's okay. This is this is who they are. It's like, and it's just things like that because you're the first stage of of this, and then like you said, it's like an eighteen year old or just finished studies. You start working at at a financial planning firm. That's what it was for me. It's like I had no idea what I was doing. And no matter if you have the qualification, it, it, it's the practical small things that kind of get you. And the work <laughs> experience. You can't you yes. can't you can't yes. uh, pass up that work, the importance of that work experience that, that comes with it. So so how long did you do that for? How long were you getting up at you know just after midnight and, and, in and total, working in the early hours? Um more than a year and a half. Yeah, just over right. a year and a half. Yeah. Yeah. I, um because what happened was that as I started working with Nathan, his business got bought um, by Tribeca uh, that December. And I had a had an a interview with Ryan, CEO of Tribeca, and he's like, okay, you seem dedicated. We'll give you a go. You know, Ryan obviously being being the the visionary here, he's like, well, well let's let's give it a go. Why not? And um, yeah, I did that. A few months later, he said we think we we'll, we can work with you. How about you don't go to the Gold Coast and we'll give you employer sponsorship and you come to Melbourne? I thought, well, have never been to Melbourne. Heard the weather is not great, but <laughs> you know, let's let's give it a give it a go. So we started the process where um, Tribeca imp- gave me employer sponsorship. Now, what that means on a, on a visa level is they vouch for me at the government federal level and state level that. This guy has got a job and he is capable to work for us and we will obviously meet certain certain rules and regulations in in in, in sponsoring him for employment with us. Yeah. Um that process took a lot longer than we expected. Okay. Um 
because they had to first register the federal government to become an employer sponsor. And then my visa as well, um, starting the whole process again, that took another eight months, which is why I kind of did that the, the working from, from 1 a.m. for yeah more than a year and a half. So how long um, have you been in Melbourne now? Since January. Yeah, I got here in January, the 5th so of January. Only been, so it's only been six months, seven months that you've yes. been here. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Not not long at all. Still getting no. getting to know the place, still getting lost on the trams. So, yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but it is it, it, it is fun. So that's yeah. how I got you. Yeah. yeah. And did you, your wife came over as well? Is your wife here? No, 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 no. That's a that's a different story for it for another day. But Fair um enough. yeah, uh yeah. you know, so yeah. everything ha- everything has its price, eh? So. Yeah. <laughs> so uh so you're here so you're here working as a working as an advisor. Now before we started recording, I I mentioned professional year. So you know, yeah. a, a lot of a lot of podcasts I've recorded recently uh, are have either been with, with people that go through the professional year, some advisors that are helping people through professional year that's a, it's a big thing at the moment now for those that are wanting to become financial advisors here yeah. in Australia you obviously had a whole lot of it uh, work experience in, uh, in in South Africa being the being the financial advisor you spoke about yeah. a couple of sub few subjects that you had to do to get your Australian qualifications but you mentioned you didn't have to do the professional year can you tell us what yeah. I, I didn't know that that was a thing How, what yeah what's what's the go there so what happens is you can you can one of two things need to happen. You have to to be to not do a professional year. You have to prove to ASIC firstly that you are a foreign existing advisor. There's minimum requirements that kind of you have to meet for them to be able to to see you as a foreign existing advisor because you have to meet minimum um, years of experience um, in the fields. You have to have work in the fields that you that. That's similar to Australia, and then qualification requirements as well. So I had to apply to VET assess Australian authority that basically assesses my qualifications to be in line with what um, Australian regulations authorities see similar warrants, you know, um, yeah. which which I had to go through there. Then you apply to I applied to FASIA back then, um, and they had a look at your at, at your qualifications. You pay some money, they assess your your, ex- your experience and qualifications say, so, okay, good, you're there. I had to reapply to ASIC after, after FAS, you're um, no longer there. Yeah. And they they get in touch with this African version of ASIC, which is the FSCA, see when your, your date of first registration was as a financial advisor, how long, have you, how long you've been a financial advisor. And if, you, if they are then satisfied that you have enough experience uh, as an advisor in, in another country that they – I'm not sure what countries are all on the list, but South Africa is one of the countries that's on yeah, yeah, a, yeah. a list that they they kind of consider. Um, they give you your your number, the number that you need to write your your ASIC exam, your advisor exam. Um, I still had to write the exam, which I did, and I have to pass that. But then you don't need to do your professional year. I, I kind of have mixed emotions about that, to be honest, um, because what I the, the struggles I had and the learnings I had to go through to become a financial or to, to to actually practice my craft as a financial advisor in Australia, it feels to me like I it would not have been a bad thing to for me to do a professional year, you know, as a requirement because it's although I and I'll be the first one to admit this, although I probably although I did not have to do a professional year, I needed to do a professional year, which I did for for nearly two years. On it was online, but you just 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 the things that you learn. Um, you can't transfer some some things. You can't transfer over from another country, unfortunately. And that, that, that's exactly the point that I was going to going to make is to say, it, as much as you might not have had to have done the structured learning program that that is the professional year, you've done that anyway. You know, the yes. year and a half, two years with with Nathan, and you know, working whilst you're in, in South Africa, the, the first six, seven months or so whilst you've been here in Australia, it, yeah, you you would have had a. A, a learning program anyway might not need to have been documented in quite the same fashion. Yeah, and it, you know, that, like that's the same thing here. The 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 professional, as, as much as there's this thing called a professional year now, it wasn't a big deal for us because all of our associate advisors, much for the most part, they came from our client services team, so they were calling net wealth yeah. and they were working out what forms they needed and Correct. spent a couple of years as associate advisors yeah. to become advisors anyway. They already had that 
career yeah. path, which you've lived yourself anyway. And I mean, you would you would know yourself. It's not you know being a financial advisor is not always just about what you read in the books or the study work. It's 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 the stuff in between. It's the small things. It's it's helping clients with it might be it's knowing where what forms to compete. What's the it's the smaller things that 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 kind of makes you more efficient, better at your job, because in today's technology era, we can we can use technology to find out what's the transitional contribution gaps, you know, <laughs> or things like that. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I had, uh, had a conversation with a client yesterday, and he was talking about his fifty nine. He's like, "Oh, can I access my super?" I said, "Oh, look." Uh, I said, like I said, look, it's either going to be 59 or 60. I said, I can never remember off the top of my head because of this transition period that we're going through. Yeah. I said, I know where to find the answer. And give me 30 seconds and I'll have the answer for you. Yeah. But I don't know off the top of my head. And, and you don't need to you know the answer off the top of your head. You need to know where to find the answer or who to ask and what questions to ask, but you don't need to know the answer off the top of your head. And I think for me that that was where our, my process, my journey was really made a lot easier with Tribeca and why I kind of decided to come here in the first place is because of the support. If if anybody kind of wants to make this transition or this journey over, you have to find a place that's that provides you with a good support network or backing. Because it's like I I don't know a lot of things. I'm not I mean I've only been in Australia for seven months. I'm an advisor, but I I there's a lot of people out there that know a hell of a lot more than I do. Yeah. And and but you have to have someone that you can ask. Or, you know, have to, if you've got a good team behind you, a support network, it it's doable. It's 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 a lot of you know a lot of stuff that you have to go through, a lot of um, hurdles you have to get over. But it is possible, and just make sure that you've got a good team behind you, and it's not that hard thing. So let, let, let's talk a little bit about your your role as a financial advisor with Tribeca. So you know, you have this this kind of tagline of my good life or living your good life no. or that's some something to that effect. But what does that look like in terms of your engagements that you're then having with clients? Like how do you, someone gets referred to you, you get a phone call because they found your website or whatever. Like what what does the client engagement process look like from that first interaction with yeah. clients where you're kind of weaving in this idea of the, the good life for them? Yeah. So I think, I mean, if we're talking about where our process start, I mean, we do what most other firms to our, I would suppose we have what we call a fifty minute phone call. We just we just once a client reaches out, we talk to them, find out kind of if if we're a good fit for them and if if we can actually add value. Just it's a short call, fifty minutes. We set we call it a fifty minute phone call, it might be long. It's just an idea. Get an idea of, of we, we we if we can help. If we can, we move to a discovery meeting. Again, pretty similar to everyone else's. But I think what we do differently to Especially advice firms that I've been at and with in South Africa is that we really go hard on the well-being part of financial advice. And I know it's such a cool term to use these days, but Ryan and Brad and the people at Tribeca has been kind of going at this for a while now. And they, they refined it, and I think they, they it's, a, it's a consistent process, but I think they got it to a place now where it is really useful to clients. I had a meeting yesterday with a client where we talked about talked about specifically where do you see yourself in 10 years and we use you know stuff like you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs and we would kind of break that down into into different categories finding out from them what your goals are in 10 years and and because you know without going into deep step if you want to go very deep into it but the, the idea is that if we can get a client to visualize his future it would create action today because we know what his current situation is. We know what his, his bank balances are, super, uh, what the, what are the income expenses, everything else. But what we really want to find out is where do they see themselves in the future? So that if we can better kind of better, if we can get better at finding out and 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 helping them to visualize their future, we can plan with them along the way. If that makes sense, it's a it's a it's a tool that we use really extensively and and I don't know if you want me to to um, talk more about how we kind of approach that yeah weird yeah. please so what we do is the first one the first tool we use is, is what we call a financial well-being matrix and we break that down into four quadrants first one being um, what is a sense of security in the present so we'll ask a client to score his feeling or her feeling 
from 1 to 10, 1 being very low, 10 being very high, and tell us, so for example, what is, how do you see your sense of security um, in, in, your, in your financial um, control in the present? That would be something like um, cash flow. Are you in control of your, how, how in control do you feel about your income and expenses? Do you know where your money is going? Don't you know where your money is going? They'll say six, seven, eight, depending on how involved they are in their budgeting. The other quadrants is your 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 sense of security in the future. You know, how do you feel you'll be able to absorb any big financial shocks? We'll then go and say, all right, your feeling of f- financial freedom in the present. Give us a score. That is, do you feel you can do what you want when you want to do it? Do you feel yep. you have any financial restrictions? And the last one, uh, the bottom right quadrant is, what is your financial, do you feel you're on um, path to meet your goals in the future? Your financial freedom, you know, freedom of choice in the future. Yeah. Why we do that is, and how I see why we do that is, because well-being and, and studies have shown that clients' happiness are mostly a close, closest linked to their feeling of freedom. Is can you do what you want, when you want, for how long you want? And that's that's that what that's that's the biggest contributor to overall happiness. So and that's that's true for most people. And that you don't need to what makes you happy can be different to what makes me happy. You might want to spend time with your wife, kids, and being at work, having a mortgage, paying off of a car loan, that restricts you from doing what you actually want to do, giving you that freedom, the box on the bottom left side of the, the school. For me it might be Going on hikes, you know, working four days, whatever else that might be. So we as financial planners want to understand and break down for a client where the areas are we can improve their lives the most. So if we know, for example, that they score very low on their sense of security in the future, there's a few things that we can do to improve that. Insurance can be one thing. Because all of a sudden, you know, if you've got income protection cover, you're less worried about your ability to to, to earn an income if you can't work. Um, the same thing with your financial freedom in the future. Are you on track to meet your goals? You know, we can do modeling, SOA. We can provide them for financial advice. That's an easy one to do. So yeah, that that's 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 one tool we use. And then the next the next one would be the the ten three now, what we call a ten three now, ten yeah. years, three years, and now and. And as I said previously, what we what we kind of want to work towards is is getting clients to, in a smart way, you know, specific, measurable, actionable, um, you know, we want their goals clearly defined for them, so that we know and they know what we're working towards, and that's how we how we kind of use those to to increase their overall well being. Yeah, where in that? So I'm interested. So do the different. Different firms have different kind of engagements in terms of the, like the delivering of a statement of advice. There, there, yeah. there are firms out there that say, "This is there's all all this work and this engagement and you know, this this four quadrant thing that you've spoken about." And there's a whole bunch of work that you can do with clients that actually has nothing to do with. I actually need to issue you with a statement of advice for your income protection policy. I guess where in that journey do clients start paying fees, and and also where in that journey do do they? Do you deliver them a statement of advice in whatever format that might be delivered in? But let's call it a statement of advice. Where, where are those two things? The, the fees part and the and the delivering of advice. So the discovery meeting we we do if a client's referred to us by an existing client or or via a, a current COI network um, referred to us, they don't pay for the discovery meeting. A client do pay for the discovery meeting if they just come to us you know organically the the work we put in in that presentation working through their goals helping them to define it we do and we provide them that that presentation after the meeting because we kind of feel that even if a client don't go ahead to a statement of advice even if we don't provide you know insurance advice or whatever else it might be super advice they can walk away from the meeting with some 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 value with a better idea of where they want to go. Because, great, that, that we do. Um, and if I understand your question correctly, if, if at the back of that meeting a client feels that we can add enough value and if we feel we can add enough value to them, then we move ahead to, to actual financial advice. 
and and then obviously the process goes as as continues most, on from there. Most firms, yep. yeah. Does that yep. make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. And so, who 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 are the types of clients that you're working with at the moment? Is that is that been have, like have some existing clients of the firm been transitioned across to you? Um, like you as an individual advisor, who who are you working with at the moment? Yeah, and I think in, in due course, yes. But I, for me personally, I have a being through the journey of immigration and understanding very well what it takes to get here. My my niche, the people I want to help, the start, the, I think the area I would be able to provide the most assistance in is South African experts who have moved or want to move to Australia. You know, before before moving here, I didn't just decide I want to come here. I did a bit of market research. So I, I know there's 200 South Africans in Australia who was born in South Africa. 200,000. 200,000, right? I know there's 10,000 just in Melbourne. Um, there's There's enough people I can help you. Um, South African rules and, and what kind of kicked me off, um, you know, once when I said about the Ikigai, but when one of the one of the, the intersections, one of the things that I, that I talked to is, is what the world needs. In South Africa, what happened is in 2021, Pension Fund Amendment Act came into effect where once you immigrate, you can't take your retirement money out of a retirement fund for three years after you moved to another country. So we have a bunch of South African people currently in Australia who have money in South Africa, who can't get their money. So they need a financial advisor over there, might have a financial advisor over there, but also one over here. I am licensed in South Africa, but I'm also licensed here. So that puts me in in a, in a, in a very unique position where I'm able to help them in both countries, where I would be then. And obviously, I understand the process the budgeting, what it costs to get here, the the emotional, psychological toll it takes on you to to move across. So Incredible. That one, yeah. that, that's kind of my niche, if you want to. Yeah, and, and so once that. you once you start to kind of market that in one way, shape, mm. or form, I suspect you'll be quite successful at it. You know, just as as you're talking there, I would, and I'm, I'm trying to attract South Africans that have come come to Australia, but but I would every year probably talk to two or three that yeah. that have. They just they yes. somehow or other find their way to, to talking to me. Um, and they all talk of, we came here, you know, we had to had, had to kind of give up everything and we came here with, with nothing. And, you know, we were, yeah. that ha- had some level of, you know, success or wealth or whatever you want to call it in South Africa and then gave it for the most part up to, to come here and start again. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a lot out there that need that help. That's true. And, and, and the thing is, it's such a, I think very few people really grasp what, how, 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 what burden, how hard it is to actually uproot your whole life and move it to another country. You know, it's, 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 it's a hard thing to do. You, you invest a lot of money because it, it, it's very expensive to do it. You know, so not everyone, you know, gets a, a company who pays for their containers or pays for their flights and everything. That's not how it works. So you have to, a lot of these costs you have to kind of fit yourself. So people will use their life savings to move here, to try and build a better life. And and once they get you, as I did, they don't know anything about financial planning in Australia. They don't understand what a superannuation guarantee is or where to put their, their money, you know, industry funds or, you know, retail. They, they don't know. And and the thing is, that's kind of where I felt that um, I can make a difference. I can help people. Because, you know, the last thing you want to worry, you know, you, you have to manage things like uh, where to buy, you know, it's it's so funny. It's like walking into Coles for the first time. It's like self-checkout. This is a bit weird. It's like we, <laughs> we don't have self-checkouts, you know, in most most places and most towns and stuff in South Africa, like very a, few shops. Actually. There's a whole series, like there's a whole series of... Now, just relatively simple videos that you can do off of that to just you know, start putting on LinkedIn, TikTok, Instagram, wherever of, yeah, you know, yeah. just the, the self-checkout at Coles. How do you navigate the self-checkout at Coles? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, it's incredible once you start to think yeah. about the opportunities that are there. And the thing is, if, if you look, at, if you look at, at financial planning and what we can, the difference we can make in people's lives is, and, and you know, I'm a really a firm believer that we can make a massive difference in people's lives. We really make, it's like we help people 
and I might sound corny to some, but we help make people's dreams a reality. We help them plan for a better life, you know, to go back to the, the, the tagline of my good life. And whatever that is for whomever that is, it's it's saving for a car so you, when, you're, when your kid turns 18, uh, they can get a car. It doesn't matter what it is, but you... It's we can make things like that happen, and and if if my the people I want to help if they get to, to Australia and they have to start over in a way, if I can make that process and that journey easier for them, then that that'll make my life, um, you know, that'll make my job a lot more satisfying. It's incredibly fulfilling work, isn't it? Yeah, for exactly. You? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Dan, thank you. Uh, as I said at the start, I thought this would be a fantastic podcast, and it and it certainly has been uh, hopefully there's a there's a bit of value or oh, well is that i know there's a lot of value for whether you're a financial advisor here in australia or maybe some some of the south africans might actually pick up pick up this episode as well so dan it's been a pleasure to speak with you thank you very much for joining me today uh, thank you james appreciate appreciate the time and i mean i think most a lot of advisors listen to this and if there's financial planners out there that kind of want to make the same move move over here and want some advice or just a chat feel free to reach out i'm happy to share whatever knowledge i have where where's best if, if anyone wants to reach out to you where's best to, to find your linkedin or find me some, on linkedin yeah. i'm i'm relatively active on there yeah. so yeah just send me a message i'll, I'll respond and yeah just basically we'll LinkedIn. put some we'll put some links to your profile and so forth in the show yeah. notes of wherever anyone might be listening to this on Apple or Spotify or wherever else people might, might be listening. Awesome. Um, Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Great to, great to chat with you. Same. Thanks, James.